morning and we're believing God for some great things. This is the, the Thanksgiving, or this is the Sunday after Thanksgiving. Everybody had a good time Thanksgiving? Did uh, everybody, uh, was everybody really hungry uh, Thursday night when you went to bed? Huh? <laughs> it was bad at our house, I tell you, it was bad. Ate too much, way too much, but we had a good time. Good time of fellowship. But welcome. And uh, I want to uh, share with you some things that are on my heart. And I'm, I'm really excited about it because thinking about now that we're coming into the Christmas season, uh, I think if I'm not, not mistaken, the traditional churches would celebrate today as the first Sunday of Advent, building up right up to the Christmas Day service that many of them would have. But uh, seeing that we're, we're thinking about the Christmas things, and I was thinking as we did some Christmas carols during worship this morning. Chris uh, led us in some Christmas carols, three or four of them, I guess it was, during worship. And I, I couldn't help but noticing how much those old Christmas carols dealt with the issue of grace. Really, I was really, you know, thinking about, I think we noticed that last year, and maybe I've, I've forgotten about that a little bit, haven't thought about that much through the year, but as these are the first Christmas carols we've done uh, this year for this Christmas, and, and it amazes me how many of them uh, dealt with. There's just little hints of, of, of grace. And the fact is, is that it is good news that Jesus Christ came. It is good news that God sent Jesus Christ as that little baby because of what happened as a result. The, the, the whole purpose was for him to ultimately end up on the cross. So therefore he would die for you and I and we would be forgiven, and that's some of the stuff that we want to talk about today. But if I was to put a title on today's message, it would simply be this, More Shocking Truth. More Shocking Truth. And I want to share more shocking truth with you guys today because I feel like this shocking truth is so important because to me it's all a part of this great Christmas present that God gave us 2,000 years ago. You know, it wasn't just for Jesus to come as the baby. Again, it was because Jesus was to come as a human being, and he was ultimately to purpose. He was purposed to die upon that cross so that he could take care of all of mankind's spiritual needs. And therefore, that's why we're here today. One of the things... Denzel and I were talking a little bit about this before the service today, and it's something that I've been thinking about a lot. And that is this, that back in the day, now what we preach here now is roughly about four years old. Um, I used to, Karina and I have been in the ministry since, I, I was ordained in the ministry in 1976, way before some of you were even born. And, and, and we, we've been doing this all of those years, and one of the things, and this was, this was a hard pill to, to, to swallow, but about four years ago, we discovered that much of the stuff that we were teaching and preaching all of those years was wrong. And I tell you what, that kind of comes as a real shock. That, that really kind of deflates your ego a little bit. It, it kind of shakes up your life a little bit, shakes up your little world. And all of a sudden you realize you've been teaching people the wrong thing because there's no one that does what we do here that ever wants to be wrong. I, the last thing I would ever want to do would be to teach you guys something that's not right. And the reason is, is because, number one, I'm responsible for that. Number two is I don't want to mess up anybody's life. So, you know, I am very cautious and very careful about the things that I'm preaching and teaching. I really want to make sure that I am right on. And it really kind of shocked me, big time it shocked me. I mean, to the place where it almost caused me to be depressed and everything over this, when all of a sudden I realized that I wasn't teaching some things that were biblically truth. Now, here's what happens to most of us in the ministry. Probably to that degree... All of us today that are alive today and are, are preaching and teaching on a regular basis, we most of the time teach things to our congregations and to, our, to the groups that we're in charge of. We teach things that we personally have been taught. It's not things that God has personally shown us through the Bible, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. 
it's things that we went to, like I went to Bible college for, for three years. Um, I, I, I went to advanced uh, training and adva advanced schooling and college to receive so, a couple of master's degrees and, and, a, and a doctorate degree and, and all these things. I, I, I've had the education on some of these things, but what's happened, what happens is, is that we receive that training and it's like in, in football. Some of the things that I saw happening yesterday as I watched two of my teams go down in flames, um, I saw some very bad coaching that was going on. I saw some very bad coaching. And consequently, when, when the coaching is bad, What's going to be the response? What's going to be the result back out down there in the field? What's going to be the result, the net result on the scoreboard? You see? And, and so when our coaching is wrong, at no matter what level it is, um, no matter what level it comes to you, if your coaching is wrong or flawed, then you're going to be wrong and flawed in your idea and you're thinking about how you're supposed to live this out and walk this out in your life, you're going to be, but not only that, when it comes to you then teaching someone else, guess what you're going to be teaching them? You're going to be teaching them the same wrong thing that you've been taught. Now I'm going to tell you something, that's where so many in the church are really at today. They've been taught wrong things, many pastors and many leaders have been taught wrong things, and they continue on in that same process, if, if you will. It's like a cycle. It's a cyclical thing. It just continues to go around and around and around, and it never comes to an end until all of a sudden someone like the Holy Spirit will show someone like us and say, all of a sudden, hold it, you're, you're teaching something wrong. And it's like when that happened to Crean and I, it was like a great big huge monkey wrench was thrown into our nice little pastoral lives. And all of a sudden, whoa! And that was just four years ago. See? So I have, a, I have a long history of teaching a lot of bad doctrine and a lot of untrue things. And to that, you know, I, I apologize, uh, I feel bad about, but by the same token, I only could do what I, I knew to do. I didn't know to do any better. So I walk from that, because I know there's forgiveness of that in that as well. So, you know, I'm walking for, in the forgiveness of the Lord. But, but one of the things that I used to teach, and, and this is just really, really big in me right now, because I, I just look at it as such, you know, the ultimate salvation of God, you know, the ultimate Christmas story, you know, was, was for our salvation. God had to die on that cross. Jesus had to shed his blood for there to be the blood sacrifice that would take care of, of mankind's sin. God himself, Jesus is God himself, died upon the cross, where, where before back in the old law, remember they had to bring goats and cattle and turtle doves and all these kinds of things, and sacrifice them yearly upon the altars to make God happy. And God looked at that whole system and he said, you know, I, even though I set this up, he says, I'm setting this up for a reason. And the reason why I'm setting this up is because I want my people, Israel, to know that they can't live under that. And that there's going to be a better way coming. And, and he talked even back in Jeremiah about there being in Ezekiel and some of those Old Testament books about the day coming when there would be a new covenant. And that's the covenant that came as a result of the blood of Jesus Christ being shed. So one of the things that God, the major thing that God did through the, through the birth of Jesus Christ ultimately was what? The salvation of all mankind. Amen. The salvation of all mankind. It is God's will for all to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That's God's perfect will. So there's a lot of people today that are saved, they just don't know it. That's our job to tell them about Jesus Christ, isn't it? No? That's our job to share with them the good news about what Jesus Christ has really do done for them. But it's like, <clears throat> you know, it's, <clears throat> excuse me, like the traditional thought about, well, I'm going to go to church when I got my life straightened up. Good luck on that. You know, I'm going to go to church when, when I got, it's just like, when I get enough money, I'm going to get married. Good luck on that. 
If you're waiting to have a, enough money to get married and have children, good luck on that, you know. You'll never, you'll never, you guys, let me give you a tip here, you'll never have enough money to get married, you know. Now, that, that was a joke. <laughs> Didn't go very far, but anyway. <laughs> but how many know what I'm talking about? So, for, so God's ultimate plan is and was for mankind's salvation. But how many know that God's not a piker? He doesn't give you something and then take it away. He doesn't give you salvation because you're a good enough person to receive salvation or to be saved, does he? That's not the reason. That's not how, why he gave us salvation. Salvation is the ultimate gift of God for all of mankind. He didn't give us salvation because, well, Denzel's a good enough man here, so therefore I'm going to deem him saved, God says. Or, and Emmett's not, so I'm going to deem him as unsaved. That's not the way God does it. So if we get saved, not based upon our good works. Now stay with me here on this. If we get saved, not based upon our good works, why in the world do we think we stay saved based upon our good works? If that's the case, God's a piker. He gives us something, not because we're good enough to earn it or good enough to deserve it. He gives it to us because of why? Because his son died for our sins. Bam! It's just that simple. Totally done with. Now all of a sudden, man, you gotta, you got to be good, Earl. you got to straighten up better. You know, brother, you got to start... Shannon, especially you. I mean, you you, you got to get it together, girl, to stay safe. But isn't that what the church is? And here's what, here's the way I used to teach this. All right? And this is the way many churches, th this morning, all over Citrus County, you're going to probably, you probably see things like this going on. After the pastor's done with his sermon, he's going to give an altar call. And he's going to say, Chances are he's going to say something. Well, if there's anybody here who doesn't know Jesus Christ, please raise your hand and come up. We'll pray for you. We'll pray a sinner's prayer. Huh? We don't do that here, by the way. But he, that's something that would, would happen. But then, because there won't be any of those people or very few of those people in the service, he will quickly change gears. And he will go into gear number two. He puts in the clutch and <laughs> crams it into gear number two. And gear number two is this. Now for all of you people who messed up this week, for all of you bad people who messed up this week, for all of you bad people who thought the wrong thoughts, for all of you people that, that said the wrong words, for all of you people who did the wrong deeds, Come on up right now. Raise your hand right now, all you backsliders. Come on. Raise your hands right now and come up and rededicate your life to Jesus Christ. Angie, oh, here she comes, man. Watch out. She's fixing to run up here. Come on. Am I telling you the truth or am I not? That's the way the system works. And the reason why the system works that way is because that's the way they were taught to do it. Guess what? In Bible college, I was taught this. I was taught this. To spend as much time on my altar call as I do on preparing my sermon. And the reason is, is because my altar call, see, you preach the sermon so that you can tie your altar call in. So if your altar call is successful, in other words, if you can get, if I could get all you backsliders up here this morning, repent again, you know, it's like getting saved over and over and over and over again. If I can get you to repent again, then I can go home today, have dinner, and think to myself, oh man, did I have a good sermon today. I had a successful day in church because I got the sinners to come home. You know, most pastors, many pastors, look at their congregation, they, they think, you know, you're just as much sinners as anybody out in the world. And that's a shame, folks, and that's not the way it's supposed to be. That's not the reason Jesus Christ died for you. Now, I just fight this, because this is a battle in the church. It's called the doctrine of eternal security. It's a Calvinistic doctrine. Many of your Baptist people believe this. Some of your Reformed people believe this. And, and it basically is this, that people will not lose their salvation. And I used to fight against that. 
I used to teach the exact opposite. I used to teach it wrong. I used to teach that, yes, a person can. It's not, it's not easy to do. You have to decide in your heart that you're going to do this, or you're going to turn your back on God, and, and, and then, then you're going to walk away from God, and then you can lose your salvation. He's going to, and I used, to, I used to teach this and preach it. And here is, is where I want to go with this, and here's some of the shocking truth thing that I want to talk to you about. Here's what I used to use as a proof of what I was teaching was right. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Hebrews, the 10th chapter. Now listen to this very carefully. We're using the New Living Translation. We believe in using a modern language translation here because many people do not understand the King James Bible. And, and so we try to have an accurate... Uh, Emma, would you just set this there, my black case there next to you, please, brother? Uh, get it on my way. Uh, we, we try to encourage people to use an accurate version, which we feel the New Living is. It's pretty accurate as far as the, the Greek and Hebrew, just as accurate as anything else. But, uh, it, but it's easy to read, and it makes sense. And if you have your Bibles, turn with me to uh, uh, Hebrews, the 10th chapter, and beginning in verse 26. Now listen to me, and, and listen to how this sounds here. All right? Dear friends, if we, continue, if we deliberately continue sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer any sacrifice that will cover these sins, there is only the terrible expectation of God's judgment and the raging fire that will consume his enemies. For anyone who refused to obey the law of Moses was put to death without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Just think how much worse the punishment will be for those who have trampled on the Son of God and have treated the blood of the covenant which made us holy as if it were common and unholy and have insulted and disdained the Holy Spirit who brings God's mercy to us for we know the one who said, I will take revenge and I will pay them back. We'll end it right there for the sake of time. But I want you to think about that and say, man, if you read that, and if you only read that, you could probably make a pretty good case that yes, it is possible for a believer in Jesus Christ to lose their salvation. Because that person would purposely, deliberately continue to sin after they had learned the truth about Jesus Christ. So therefore, it's impossible to bring them back. That's, that's what Paul is saying. I believe Paul wrote this, by the way. We do not know who the writer of the Hebrew letter was. I, I personally believe it was Paul because it's a slot of the type, and uh, it's the same as Paul's writings, and, and the doctrine, by all means, is the same. But, but, but it doesn't make any difference. The writer to the Hebrew letter here, the, what, it is, what they're saying is that if you continue in sin... There is not any help for you. There is, no any, there is no longer any hope for you. And those of us who, as I used to preach, that people can lose their salvation would come back to this passage of Scripture time in and time out. I'd like to have a dollar right now for every time I, I talk to someone or argue the point that, yes, indeed, someone can lose their salvation, I'd take them back to these verses of Scripture. I would use them. It was like a, if I was a carpenter I, I, and I had a hammer and a, and a saw and a nail gun and a screwdriver, different things in my toolbox, it'd be like I'd go back to the, fa the, the, the familiar tools. And every time I'd get into one of those discussions, that, this passage of Scripture would come up. Now, here's the problem. Um, Matthew is just telling us that, that a lot of our viewers uh, have watched the videos on our four rules of proper Bible interpretation. Um, we have a video. If you want to, those of you that are watching, uh, if you'd like to go to youtube.com uh, and, and scroll down to New Covenant Grace Fellowship, our page there and our videos, you can find the, those, I believe. I can't remember the title of it, but the Four Rules of Proper Bible Interpretation, I think is the title of that video. So we have that there for you archived, and you can, you can look at that anytime you want to. But to just give you a quick synopsis on it, we have four basic rules of proper Bible interpretation. The first rule is, who is it written to? It's essential that you understand who the Bible, uh, any verse of Scripture, you want to make some doctrine, who was it written to? Number two, read it in context. Number three, do not take an obscure, standalone verse of Scripture and make a doctrine out of it. If you have one verse of Scripture that says go right and you have six go left, do not, do not go to the bank on the one that says go right. And here's the reason why. 
When you apply rule number one, who's it written to? Rule number two, context, to that standalone obscure verse of Scripture, all of a sudden it's going to make sense and it'll fit right in with the rest of them. All right? Rule number four is what? It's not to make doctrine out of directional verses of Scripture and not doctrinal verses of Scripture. There's many verses of Scripture that in the Bible that are, are direction. Or what I might say would be, for instance, Paul or some other writer's idea on something. And oftentimes they'll, they'll qualify this. But, but God has really said this. Well, if God really says that, then that's something you can make some doctrine out of. But, but, but if someone says, well, I think that this is the way it is, don't make doctrine out of that. All right? Examine that. For instance, Paul says that it's good for people not to be married and if they're going to serve the Lord. Well, don't make a doctrine out of that. You know, that's, that's just, you know, for convenience sake. Yeah, we understand that if you're in the ministry. But don't, don't make a doctrine out of that, you see. So those are our four different rules of Bible interpretation. What we want to do is apply rule number one, who is it written to, and context, rule number two, to these verses in, in Hebrews 10, 26 through, the, through um, uh, 30, through 29, actually. All right? Let's, who is it written to? In order to do this and to keep it in context, let's just, just take a look at chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. Now, stay with me as we go through this. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but, but I have to do this so that you understand the rest of this passage of Scripture. Here, again, one of the things that we try to say around here is think. One of the things that I want you guys to do more than anything else is to think for yourself. Don't just swallow the Kool-Aid, you know? Don't just swallow the Kool-Aid I'm dispensing today. You know, think about what I am saying to you. Pray about what I'm saying. Don't just believe everything that Larry Silverman says to you and say, oh man, that's the truth. Think for yourself. Let the Holy Spirit show you himself what is the truth and you'll never go wrong. See, I am still a human being. I know I try to tell my wife how perfect I am all the time. That doesn't go very far. But I am a human being. I will make mistakes. You see? So it's important that you understand to think for yourself. And we're not afraid of thinkers in our church. All right? All right. Beginning in chapter 10, verse 1. That old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow, a dim preview of the good things to come. He's talking about the old covenant, the law under the, the law of Moses, uh, where, again, those old covenant where the, where the uh, sacrifices were made upon the altar every year, so on and so forth. And he says it's not, it was only a shadow. It was a dim preview of the good things to come, not the good things themselves. The sacrifices under that system were repeated again and again, year after year, but they were never able, key word, never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. If they could have provided perfect cleansing, the sacrifices would have stopped, for the worshipers would have been purified once and for all times. Now, what is this writer saying here? This, this is an important verse of Scripture. He says, listen, under that old covenant, under that old law, under that old system, he says, if it was good, if it was really good, then it would have been for all times. There would have been need for no more sacrifice. Now, if that's the case under the old covenant, what? How much more so is it under the new covenant that we're living in now? You see? All right. Now, now keep that thought in the back of your mind. In other words, what we're saying here is this, this is one of the doctrines of our church, okay? We're saying that it is done. It is finished. Jesus did it all upon the cross 2,000 years ago. It's not up to you to perform. It's not up to you to be good enough because how many know we'll never be good enough? But we are good because of what Christ has done for us. That is the Christmas gift. You see? That is what's so wonderful about this stuff. All right? Verse, um, verse uh, 3 here. But instead... Those sacrifices actually reminded them of their sin year after year. That's all, that, that's all the old law was for. It was to remind them of their sin year after year. Verse 4, for it's not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. That's why Christ came into the world. Now, let me just, let me just say this. It says, he says, it's not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. And then he goes on to say, but, but that's why Christ came into the world. So Christ came into the world to do what? Take away sins. 
So if Christ, God himself, took away something, come on now, stay with my reasoning here. If God, Christ, came and took away something, is there any way that it can remain? Think. Think. And say, oh, oh, now hold it. You're saying we're perfect spiritually, but guess what? We're all going to still do dumb, stupid things of the flesh from time to time. And those things are going to get us into trouble. There are consequences. But here's the point we want you to see. They may be dumb, stupid things of the flesh, but I want you to know they ain't sin. Because if Christ took it away, how could it still exist, Denzel? Our conversation is more. If Christ took it away. All right, stay with me. I mean, I, that's all I'm doing is reading this. That's not what I've been taught to teach. It's what the book says. And the Holy Spirit says, yeah, it's right on. But instead, verse 3 again, but if instead those sacrifices actually reminded them of their sins years after year after year, that for it's not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins, that's why. When Christ came into the world, he said to God, you did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, but you have given me a body to offer. You are not pleased with burnt offerings or other offerings for sin. Then I said, look, I've come to do your will, O God, as is it is written about me in the scriptures. Verse 8, first Christ said, you did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings or burnt offerings or other offerings for sin, nor were you pleased with them though they were required by the law of Moses. Then he said, look, I have come to do your will. He cancels, what? Christ cancels the first covenant in order to put the second into effect. For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ. Now I love this, once for all time. What part about once for all time don't people understand? Come on. <laughs> it's right there. It's right there. It's always been right there. Under the Old Covenant, verse 11, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never take away sins. But our high priest, our high priest, who's that? Jesus, our high priest, offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. Then he sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand. Now, I say this oftentimes, it gets me in a lot of hot, hot water. As you can imagine, this kind of teaching, you can imagine there are, few, <laughs> there are a lot that would disagree with what I'm saying and teaching here. But they do, I'm just going to say flat out, they're wrong. <laughs> you know. And the reason why, because I'm just reading it to you as simple as I can. But here's the problem that we have. If you believe that you are still a sinner, if you believe that you still can sin after you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you believe you still can sin, you've got a big problem. What, what do you mean, what, what's the problem? The problem is, is that Jesus is no longer on the cross. It's empty. He's no longer on the cross. Where is Jesus now? He, he says right here, Paul says, he is what? He is seated. He sat down at the place of honor at the right hand of God. In other words, Jesus is no longer doing sin forgiving. So if you, and that's what they, they'll say. Well, you know, you, come on, everybody, you, all, all of you people that came, that, all of you people that sinned today, at the end of this message, I want you to come forward and kneel before, uh, before the altar here and, 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 and confess your sins to Jesus Christ, and then God's going to forgive you. I want you to know that that is impossible to happen. It's impossible. Why? Because he's not on the cross anymore. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. He's no longer forgiving sins. Why do you say, Larry, he's no longer forgiving sins? I say he's no longer forgiving sins because he did forgive sin. It's done once for all time. Boy, what a Christmas present. <clears throat> 
Come on, I, some, some of you people, you, some of we got some new people. I don't know you. I haven't met you. I don't know who you are. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what you've been. I don't care. I don't care what your past is. You know what? We, we have a church full of people with shady past. Believe me. <laughs> we, we have, you name it, we've got it here. Oh, thank you. I don't know where that came from. That came from over there someplace. But, but listen, we have... We have a bunch of shady characters in this church. <laughs> you, you better believe we do. But here, here, here's the deal. We don't care about anybody's past. We only care about where they're going. And here's the deal. Your past is under the blood of Jesus Christ. You say, well, I've never, I've never prayed that sinner's prayer, all that stuff. You know what? Just start believing right. Just start believing that Jesus Christ loves you and God saved you. Just what? You're just as saved as I am. You start believing that Jesus Christ loves you, you're just as much a Christian believer in him than I am. It's just that simple. And then tell somebody about it. All right. Man, I'm starting to smell chilly around here. Wow. Come on. You got, am, I, am, I, am I reading this stuff right? Am I, am I, am I, you know, am I, am I reading this right, brother? Once for all time, he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. That's verse 14. And then we're going to skip, no, I guess we won't. Because we talked about this in the last, last Sunday's message, but this is in verses 15 through, um, through, um, um, 18 here. Um, he, 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 this is a partial quote from Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, dealing with in the middle of the old covenant. God said there will one day be a new covenant. Well, look what God says back in Jeremiah. Now this is a quote. He repeats it earlier in, in, Jer in Hebrews chapter 8, but he, he repeats it the second time here in Hebrews 10. So w when someone repeats something, quotes something twice, man, that's pretty important stuff, I would think, all right? But, but, but this is what he says here. This is a repeat again. This is of Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34 in the Old Testament where God says to his people, Israel, this, the day is coming, I'm going to give you a new covenant. That this old way, you're not going to see it in your lifetime, but your people up, a, up the road will see this, all right? And so verse 15, the Holy Spirit also testified that this is so, for he says, this is the new covenant I will make with my people on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. And then he says in verse 17, look at this, underline this, you know, I will never again remember their sins and lawless deeds. What part of never again do we not understand? Never again means what? Never again. It can't happen. I will, but, but Lord, I did this, I did that. I don't, you, 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 here's what's so funny about this. According to what we're reading here, some of these people, say, well, you know, I, I go out and commit all this sin and, you know, th this old system like we were talking about, you know, getting the people up, repenting, all, the, all you backsliders, come on. All you people committed sin this week, come on, you backsliders. You, you're all a back, bunch of backsliders, come on up and get right with God, you know. And, 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 and all the time we're doing all this and God said, what in the world are they doing down there? You know what? God doesn't even understand what's going on in a lot of churches today. Well, well we're doing this to please the Lord. The Lord said, what are you, you know, you can't, you can't believe, you can't please me by doing these things. Why are you trying, this is what God is saying to some of the pastors and some of the churches today. Why in the world are you trying to please me with things that I've already done? If you really want to please me, Believe in what I have done. Don't come up with a new way. Come on. Calling yourself a person, well, I went out and I got mad at Kareem this week and I committed this sin. What did I just do when I said something like that? I trampled upon the blood of Jesus Christ. I took the finished work of the cross where Jesus said it is finished and I said, you know what, that's not good enough for me. Because someone told me, I can't do that, you dirty rotten sinner. 
You see, what did I say? Does that mean I'm perfect? No, it means in the spirit I am, but it means I will do dumb, stupid things of the flesh, and I might get angry with my wife from time to time. I might say something bad to my wife from time to time, but here's the neat thing about it. When I'm learning this stuff, as I've been learning about this stuff, about new covenant grace, guess what I, I think? You know, you'd have to ask her to be sure, but I think I'm a better husband these last four years than I've ever been in my life. Why? Because I'm now understanding that I'm right with God all the time. And so I'm finding myself doing dumb, stupid things of the flesh less and less and less and less because of what Christ has done for me. Let's wind this down here. Here we are. And then the writer to Hebrews says, in verse 19, and so, dear brothers and sisters, who is he writing to? Take it. Put your name there. So, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. Now, why, why can he say this? Why is he saying this? Context is the key, rule number two. Why? Why is he saying what he's saying in verse 19? Because of what he has previously said in verses 1 through 18 that we've just read through and covered. All right? Are you with me so far? So there, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. Can you enter into heaven's most holy place because you're a good person? Because you're good enough to do it? Because you got your life all straightened out, never make a mistake, never goof up, never mess up, huh? Or do we enter into the most holy place? The most holy place, by the way, that is the very holy of holies. That's where God himself reigns. By the way, that's within us, but that's another message for another time. But we enter in because of the blood of Jesus Christ, not because we, not because you, put your name there, not because you are good enough, it's because of what Christ has done for you. All right? Verse 20, by his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. Get this, for our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. Let us hold tight. This is what I've been saying around here. You know, hold tightly to these words that we're teaching you around here. Hang on to these words. that you Because you're going to go through things that are going to upset your apple cart. And from time to time, here's what happens to every one of us. When we start going into a rough place, one of the first things that comes to our mind, well, there must be something wrong with me. You know, here's the reason why you're going through the rough place is because there's all kinds of things right with you and there's something else out there that doesn't like what's happening right in your life, trying to pull you down. It's amazing. I'm going to tell you this about religion in case you haven't discovered it yet. But religion wants to make you feel just as miserable as it feels. It wants to bring you right in. Come on. How many know there's not a lot of joy in Mudville with the religious people? Come on. Not a lot. That's from Casey at the bat, by the way. Not a lot of joy in Mudville because they done lost the game. Wasn't a lot of joy in Ann Arbor last night. Wasn't a lot of joy in Gainesville last night. Come on. Now you just stop that. Huh? In the most, listen to me. It is, it is the most ridiculous gesture I've ever seen as I was watching that game last night. As I watched, what's all this stuff? Huh? Come on. Isn't that a bunch of ridiculous stuff? But on the other hand, don't this make a lot of sense? Now, I was expecting an amen out of some of you on that. Yeah. Feel fear the spirit. No. Oh. 
So let us hold on tightly without wavering, verse 23, to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise, to act to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect, oh, this is a good one, and not, let us not neglect <laughs> our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is near, dawn on you. Here's the deal. You guys, we, we encourage you to attend these meetings. And here's the reason why we, because you need this stuff. This is that <laughs> shot in the arm thing we talked about a few weeks ago. Because you leave here, guess what? It all comes like hell against you. Come on. You need to come to a place, you need to be in a place where you can be feeling good about yourself, where you feel better about yourself than when you arrive. And, and knowing that God has done something special for you. Stay away after a while, you start thinking to your own thoughts, and, and you begin to go back into that old way of thinking. And how many know that old way of thinking is stinking thinking from the very get-go? All right. Let's hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Now we go into verse 26, and that's where I started with. Talking about the verses that I used to use to disprove everything I just said. <laughs> but, but here's the problem. Dear friends, no, number one, what was the writer of Hebrews talking about in verses 1 through 25? What was he talking about? Who, who wants to venture a guess? Come on, Chris, teacher. Huh? What was he talking about? Huh? He was talking about what? The law. Come on, what was he? He was talking about the law ending... And sin ending, being forgiven completely, right? All sin being taken care of. Why? Because the law has been taken care of. All sin. Here's what we say around here. Where there is no law, there is no sin. Now, will you do dumb, stupid things to the flesh? This is about the fourth time I've said this. Yes, you will do, and are there sometimes consequences of, oh, yeah. involved? Oh, yeah, you know, you know, but here it is, it's not sin, and here's the reason why we're so strong on this. We have, the church has taught this sin thing, down our throats, down our throats, down our throats, and we think, well, you know what, we screw up the least little bit, we're going to go to hell. That's not what is being said here. That's not what Paul or the writer of the Hebrew letter is teaching. Hell has nothing to do with these things that we're talking about. So, based upon that, this is what the writer is referring to. He's referring to those other verses ahead of verse 26. And he says, listen, I'm showing you that the sin issue is taken care of. I'm showing you that the law is taken care of. And now he goes on to say to brothers and sisters, he's going on to say what? Dear friends, if, you, if we deliberately continue sinning, after we have received knowledge of the truth, there is no longer any sacrifice that will cover these sins. Didn't we say the same thing earlier? Because what happened? Why is there no longer a sacrifice to cover the sins? Because Jesus is no longer in the sin-forgiving business. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. So who is he talking about here? Who is he addressing this to? He is addressing this to people not that are out there doing horrific, tor terrible, horrendous, sinful, dirty, filthy, rotten things. He's talking about those who are coming out from underneath grace and placing themselves back under the law. <clears throat> Here's the deal. If you put yourself back under the law, then what have you done? You, bat, you put yourself back into the place of what? Sin. Let us hold, you know, dear friends, if we can deliberately continue sinning after we've received knowledge of the truth, there's no longer any sacrifice that will cover these sins. There's only the terrible expectation of God's judgment and the raging fire that will consume his enemies. For anyone who refused to obey the law of Moses, he, he's referring to the thing that we're talking about here. 
He's referring to, in these verses, the, the earlier verses here from verse 1, dealing with the law issue. He says, if you refuse to obey the law of Moses, you are put to death without mercy. And the testimony, on the testimony of two or th or just two or three witnesses, just think how much more the worse the punishment will be for those who have trampled on the Son of God and have treated the blood of the covenant which made us holy as if it were common and unholy and have insulted and disdained the Holy Spirit who brings God's mercy to us. Now here is the shock point. And some of you, maybe some of you who are watching, maybe you're not even watching by now, I don't know. But here is the shock point. Here's the one. Do you know, do you know who it is that has treated the blood of the covenant, who has trampled on the Son of God, and have treated the blood of the covenant which made us holy as if it were common and unholy, unholy, and have insulted and disdained the Holy Spirit who brings God's mercy to us? Do you know who that group of people is? Not. That's scary. This is scary to me. Here's the, here's the thing. I hear all the time. Well, you know, we're, we're all the church. You know, everybody, if you just believe in Jesus Christ, it's, it's enough. You, if you teach and if you believe that you still sin, and if you teach your people that you still sin, guess what you have done? You have trampled on Jesus Christ and you have, you have treated the blood of the covenant, which makes you holy. Now, am I reading this right? You guys tell me. Is this what it's saying, or is this something that I'm making up here? Am I just trying to vent my, my issues here? I hear this all the time. Well, Larry, Larry you, you just vent your stuff. Maybe, some people have actually told me, well, you, you, you've been so hurt in the past, so that's why you, you preach some of this stuff. It has nothing to do with that, folks. That's all I'm doing is reading the book. If, because the whole issue is dealing with, with sin. It's dealing with the law. I got people all the time that, that say, well, we're still under the law. Well, what do you do with this? See, what you're doing then, here's, here's the deal. You've trampled on the Son of God, and if you, and you're treating the blood of the covenant, which makes you holy, as if it were common and unholy, and have insulted and disdained the Holy Spirit who brings God's mercy to you. One more passage of Scripture, and I'll close for sure. Galatians chapter 5. And, 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 and this is what motivates me. And I know, you know what, the people, man, I don't want to go to a church like that. I want to, you'd be surprised how many people want to go to a church where they believe they're still sinners. A lot of people don't want to hear this message. Why people would want to go someplace where they're beat up every Sunday is beyond me. I don't know, but um, <laughs> I'd go to someplace where there's some life. But listen, listen to this. This is in Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. So Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. There's some good advice. This did come from the Apostle Paul, by the way, to the church in Galatia. He wrote this for sure. Listen, I, Paul, tell you this. If you're counting on circumcision to make you right with God, then Christ will be of no benefit to you. I'll say it again. If you're trying to find favor with God by being circumcised, you must obey every regulation in the whole law of Moses. Now, he's dealing with the issue of circumcision because that's the issue that came upon them. Uh, as In Galatia, it was a Gentile church, and the Judaizers from Jerusalem were following Paul, and they were saying, you know, you, you need to tell these people, or come, these Gentiles are coming to Christ. They're not Jews. They're coming to Christ. But, and you've got to tell them they all need to be circumcised. And, and Paul's rising up against that here, you know. That's what the whole letter to the book of Galatians, this whole letter of the book of Galatians is all about. He says, again, he says, he says this, I'll say it again, if you're trying to find favor with God by being circumcised, you must obey every regulation in the whole law of Moses. Now notice with me verse 4. For if you are trying to make yourselves right with God by keeping the law, you have been cut off from Christ 
you have fallen away from God's grace. That is a powerful verse of Scripture. And that's one of the things that motivates me to do what I do and to say what I say. That's what motivates me. I, I, I tell you what, put some of this stuff on Facebook and some of these things. People, whoa, will they rise up against this stuff? I'm sure there are people going to rise up against this video. But you know what? I don't care because it is the truth of God's word. And I'm telling you something. You can't trample upon the blood of Jesus Christ. You can't trample upon his blood. And God has called up some of us to say that's not going to happen anymore. And guess what? As a result, our lives are being changed. That is the shocking truth of the new covenant. That is the shocking truth to the new covenant. But it's an awesome, awesome, awesome place to be. And you'll watch things happen in your life that will literally transform you. So, Father, we come to you right now in the name of Jesus Christ, and we thank you and we praise you for your love. Oh, God, we thank you for Jesus today. We just thank you for Jesus. Jesus, you're so awesome. You're so wonderful. And we praise you and we thank you for it. We thank you for what you've done. Father, we praise you for it. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, those of you that are watching today. We trust that this has been a blessing to you. Uh, keep in touch. We love you. We pray for you often. God bless you. In Jesus' name.